I guess we're going to have the opposite end of the spectrum now because um, I'm not going to talk about any particular systems or anything. So this is for the more mathematically minded among you. Um, so what I want to talk about is semantics of advanced data types. And um, as everyone else does, um, I have four lectures um, to talk about this. And when I say semantics, I mean mathematical semantics. I don't mean um, like an operational semantics or machine-based semantics. So during, um, during this um, talk or during my course, um, I think what we've been programmed don't go wrong, or at least they don't go wrong in the obvious ways. And um, of course, um, data types are an important part of any type system. In fact, we just saw a whole bunch of programs in Nichols' lecture um, about um, data types like right at the end. And so what data types do is they let us um, express some correctness. Patricia, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, okay. Did you go to the next slide or you're still? Um, I'm on the, oh, you can't see it? Okay, hang on. Um, I did. Let's see. Uh, because we don't see it. Okay, all right. That's good to know. Um, okay, so this is exactly what we tried yesterday and now it's not working. <laughs> All right, so I have um, I have a suggestion, which is why don't let me just leave it like this, so you can still see the whole thing. Yeah. All right. So can you see me going through the oh, slides yes. now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just do it like this. This strange that yesterday worked. Hmm. I know it's a different day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Sorry. Yeah. While we're on pause, and maybe first answer a bit previous question. Like what data types are considered advanced? Well, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. All right, thanks. Okay, so just give give me a second to to kind of set the stage a little bit. All right. So um, again, um, I'm saying that data types are an important part of any type system, and one of the things that they let us do is express correctness properties um, of our programs. So the fancier your data types the more sophisticated the correctness properties you can express. So um, then if you're in a statically typed language, of course, um, type checking will allow you to guarantee the correctness of your uh, programs with respect to these properties. So to answer the question that you just posed, in this course, we're gonna consider the following kinds of data types. I'm going to look at um, algebraic data types, and then I'm going to look at nested types. And then I'm going to look at GADTs or generalized algebraic data types. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what each of these um, classes of data types um, is and about the kinds of properties that they can express. So this is all coming up, but all I'm trying to do right now is just sort of set the stage in general. Okay. But I will say this about data types it's standard to think of them as um, containers for uh, data elements that are arranged in certain positions that are determined by a data type shape. And we think of the shape as being determined by the data types constructors. Okay, so the data constructors. So like for list, it would be like nil and cons, the types of nil and cons. And so what we're gonna see is that by varying the, um, the types of the data constructors or the kinds of types the data constructors can have, we get these different classes of data types. So again, this will all be explained, but I'm again, just trying to kind of set the stage right now. Okay. And so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask and answer some questions like what kinds of properties can each of these classes of data types express and um, what kinds of what kinds of models can we build to understand the classes of data types? Because you know some of us um, are really happy to look at a lot of syntax, but some of us think more mathematically. And so we, we, um, we want to have a model, a mathematical model to think about. And then we'll ask questions like, you know, what properties, what do the properties of these models say about how we can compute with and reason about programs that involve these, um, these cl different classes of data types. Okay, so um, let me just um, organize my screen a little bit. I'm sure it looks fine from your point of view, but from my point of view, it's a little bit, um, a little bit of a mess right now. So um, just because I had the full screen thing going on. So just, um, just give me a second. All right. So from my point of view, this looks a lot better. <laughs> Again, from your point of view, probably no difference. 
Okay, so um, here's the course outline. So again, we have four lectures. So the first lecture today is gonna to be about the syntax and semantics of um, algebraic data types and nested types. And again, I will say what each of these is. The lecture um, tomorrow will be about the syntax and semantics of GADTs. So these are generalized algebraic data types. Um, I guess I'm also assuming that people have some familiarity with um, functional programming, just like Nikhil was. The third lecture on Wednesday, I'll be talking about um, parametricity for algebraic data types and nested types. And then in the fourth lecture, I'll talk about parametricity, but now for, um, for GADTs. Okay, so what we're going to see is that um, ADTs and nested types have this kind of container property that I talked about on the last slide. So again, we think of our data types as kind of containers for data, and the container is determined by the shape of the data type, and the shape is determined by the types of the constructors. Okay, and so for ADTs and nested types, they will have this, this kind of container property. And the reason that GDTs are singled out separately. Um, right, so lectures one and three are about ADTs and nested types kind of grouped together, and lectures two and four are about GADTs kind of separately, is because um, the situation for GADTs is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so, um, you know, like I said, we're going to look at um, ADTs and nested types like the syntax and semantics. And then we're gonna look at these data types through the lens of parametricity because that can help us understand how to think about and how we can reason about these data types. Right, so here's lecture one. And um, today what we're gonna do is look at ADTs and nested types. Tomorrow we'll look at GADTs. And since I'm thinking about a mathematical semantics and by mathematical now I happen to mean categorical, I'm going to um, make the assumption that you have some basic familiarity with categories and functors and natural transformations. So some, some kind of um, basic um, ideas from category theory. So, um, but what I'm gonna do as I go along is remind you of the basic definitions. Now, it won't be enough of a reminder that if it's the first time you're seeing it, it will all make sense, okay? But if it's the first time you're seeing it, hopefully what it will do is help you um, see why you might care about these categorical ideas and what they have to do with data types. So hopefully that will be um, interesting for you and motivating even if you don't get all the details. And if you are familiar with these ideas, then hopefully it won't be um, such a long reminder that you can fall asleep for too long. Okay, so let's sleep a little bit, but not too much. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about um, algebraic data types, and you actually just saw some of these in Nikhil's lecture. So an algebraic data type lets us express some very simple kinds of correctness properties of, um, of programs that involve them. And for example, if I thought about something like the data type of Booleans, then that's going to allow us to express the property that a datum is um, one of two distinct values, right? Just either true or false. And if I looked at the type of natural numbers, that would allow us to express the correctness property that a datum is one of um, infinitely many uh, values. And these are sort of um, constructed one from the other in the usual way. So one count, countably many elements here. If I look at list, this allows us to um, encode the property that um, I have a linearly ordered collection of data, um, possibly with repetitions. And if I had the data type of binary trees, then I'd be saying something like, well, my data is organized into a binary tree. I don't have a better way to say it than that, <laughs> okay? So the thing that you should really notice here, so these, hopefully these are familiar to you, these kinds of um, data type declarations. And the thing that, um, these are an AGDA. And the thing that you should um, notice is that for each of these, let's just look at this one. For each of these data types, um, if I'm looking at the, the data type list, then you'll notice that the list at A, so the data type of list of elements of type A is only defined in terms of lists of elements of type A. Okay, and this will change later on when we look at fancier kinds of data types. Similarly, well, I mean, obviously, um, Booleans are only defined in terms of Booleans and Nats are only defined in terms of Nats. But here, same thing happens with trees. So a tree of A and B, so I'm thinking here of um, A data at the leaves and B data at the nodes, right? Um, the, the data type tree AB is only defined in terms of tree AB. So a leaf takes an A thing and gives me a tree AB, and a node takes two tree ABs and a B thing and gives me a new tree AB. 
And the point here again is that um, tree ABs are only defined in terms of tree ABs. So in particular, if you give me um, a data type A, then I can make a list of elements of type A. And if you give me another data type B, then I can make a list of elements of type B. And these don't have anything to do with each other. I mean, they have the same kinds of structure, but list A is defined independently of list B, okay, or list C or W or whatever, okay? So um, these are the kinds of data types that we think of when we talk about um, algebraic data types or ADTs. So again, what I just said is that the only instance of the data type being defined that appears in the type of the constructors is the one is the same as the one that's being defined. That's the, the defining characteristic of an ADT. So what that means is that an ADT defines a whole family of inductive types, one for each, each of its choice of parameters. So again, if I go back, um, again, I get, an induct I get one inductive data type for each choice of A, or here I get one inductive data type for each choice of A and B. Okay. So um, just um, in case anybody is interested, AGDA does have a kind of general description of its ADTs. And so I can, um, I copied that down here so we can, we can have a, a look at it, but um, it doesn't seem to actually coincide with exactly what's implemented in AGDA. <laughs> um, AGDA seems to accept more things than are actually um, described here, but there is this um, very general form of an algebraic data type that's in the, um, that's given in the AGDA implementation or in the AGDA document, documentation. So um, there's a particular kind of form. So the return types are always the data type applied to the exactly the same um, instance that we're defining. And then I have a bunch of constructors and their types, you know, might take, they might take some arguments to make something of the data, of the data type that I'm constructing. And I have some restrictions that, like I said, don't seem to be um, exactly as general as what um, Agda will accept. And then there's this kind of strict positivity requirement, this requirement that um, the arguments, um, that the arguments to the constructors um, are all sort of strictly positive in um, these uh, parameters A1 through AN. And it do, I don't really want to talk about like all the, um, the details of that, but the point is that the strict positivity requirement means that you don't have negative occurrences of D in the argument types of the constructors. So I don't have negative occurrences in these, in these TIJs. And one of the things that that means, and the thing that's important for us, is that it means that um, the data type can be interpreted as the least fixed point of a functor. Okay, so that's the um, the key thing. Uh, what's that... a negative occurrence? Sorry, if, if I what's a negative occurrence? Oh, sorry, no, no questions. I should... <laughs> so it just means. Um, so that's what I said. I don't really want to get into all the things that that means. But what's important? What it means is that um, somehow you're not uh, to the left of too many arrows. <laughs> okay. So if I'm writing the time, yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that. No, that's thanks. okay. Um, I'm, I'm not to the left of too many arrows. So the important thing is that um, I want a data type to be interpreted as the least fixed point of a functor. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that in the next slide. Okay. All right, so now we need a little category theory interlude. So um, those of you who are familiar can have your snooze now. And those of you who aren't can um, see how well you do. Okay, so um, if you're new to, to category theory, you could think of categories as kind of an abstract version of the theory of sets and functions. So a category is gonna have some objects. So if I were thinking about sets and functions, I would think of these as sets. And for every pair of objects, I'm gonna have a class of, what we call them morphisms between them. And mm -hmm. I think of morphisms as like functions going from X to Y, okay? And then every time I have an object, again, I could think of it as a set, if I'm thinking, just trying to build my intuition, um, I have an identity on that set. So I have an identity morphism for that object. And I have a notion of composition that will compose two morphisms, well, assuming that their types line up in the right way, right? So if I have F going from X to Y and G going from Y to Z, then I can make, um, G after F or F composed G, however you want to think about it, going from X to Z. And I didn't give these um, 
these things na I, like, named randomly. So the identity morphisms are expected to behave like identities in the sense that if I, pre if I either post-compose or pre-compose, I should, with a function, I should get the function back. Composition is expected to be associative just as it is um, for sets, for functions between sets. And instead of using this kind of um, object of, of C notation for the objects of a category C, I might write X colon C and I'll write as I did above that F goes from X to Y rather than F is in the, this set of morphisms. I mean, it's just notation. So again, um, if you're unfamiliar, you can think just about sets and functions. Okay. The only difference is that whereas sets have a notion of element hood, so you can kind of get inside the set, right? An arbitrary category's objects don't have a way to look inside, or at least an obvious way to look inside. Okay. Then if I have a couple of categories, a functor going from one to the other um, is basically comprised of two things. So it has a function that goes from the objects of the first category to the objects of the second category. And it has a function that will take uh, morphisms in the first category to morphisms in the second category, but in a way that um, respects the domain and the, and the, the action of the domain um, under this func the object functor, uh, the object function and the code the action of the um, codomain under the action of the object function. So um, if I, in other words, what I'm saying is that I have, if F is a functor, then I can think of it as having two pieces. It has this kind of action on objects. And I can also think of it as having this action on morphism. So if I have a morphism that goes from X to Y, then F is going, well, this map F, this, this functor is going to take um, this morphism to something that goes between fx and, F and fy. And this is the same fx and fy that are obtained from this first part of the function. Okay. And um, of course, I can't just pick any old thing I want. A functor has to preserve the fundamental structure of the category. So the fundamental structure of the category is given by identities and composition. So the functor should preserve identities and composition. So what that means is that if I map, um, if I have F and G and they are they ap compose appropriately, then if I map G and then map F, but I don't know which way to read this. So I guess if I'm reading it in terms of what I do, I'm mapping F and then I'm mapping G, that's the same thing as composing the functions and then mapping the result. <clears throat> and if I want to map um, the identity, then that's the same thing as if I were to take the identity on um, things of the uh, type f of x. Okay. So a functor is just something that maps objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms, but what it does is it preserves this fundamental structure of the category. Okay, so the overall goal here is to give what's called um, an initial algebra semantics to algebraic data types. That's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to say like, hey, what, what do our uh, data types mean mathematically? So an overview that I, again, will expand in the coming slides is that if you have an ADT, you have an algebraic data type, it should have an underlying functor because of that strict positivity requirement that I mentioned. Okay, that's precisely what that, um, what that requirement is for. And then I can use um, something called the transfinite construction of free algebras to construct some free algebras for these functors. Again, this is just the overview part. So it turns out that the carrier of such an algebra for a functor F is the least fixed point of the functor. So the overall goal is that if you have an algebraic data type and it's defined um, in Agda or in your programming language by um, some equation, like the data type is F of the data type, where F denotes the underlying functor, and we'll have some examples in a minute, then we're going to interpret the data type as a least fixed point. So here what I'm saying is the algebraic data type is a fixed point for the functor that underlies this 
description, this kind of ag defunctor in this case. Um, and if that's the case, then what I want to do is interpret my data type as the least fixed point. Okay, so let's um, say a little bit more about what this involves and then we'll have some examples. So what is this transfinite construction of free algebras? Well, it says, and there's some grayed out parts here, that's because um, I'm going to be vague about the requirements on the category that I need in order to construct the free algebra. But what this is saying is that if C is a category that interprets my types. So I think of my types as being elements of a category. And if zero is the initial object of C, so that means that zero is an object of the category and that there is a morphism, a unique morphism from that object to any other object. Okay, so this would be the empty set and set, for example. And if my functor happens to be continuous, but again, you can kind of ignore that because I'm being deliberately vague. Then F has an, an initial algebra, whatever that means. And the fixed point is computed this way. So this should look really familiar because if you, um, like even if you wanted to compute fixed points in a domain or something, you would compute, you might do that in exactly the same way, right? Start with the bottom element, apply the functor or function to that object, keep doing it, and eventually converge at a fixed point, okay? So we're doing the same thing here, but we're doing it in, in categories. I have uh, Patricia, that we have two questions from the chat, if you want okay. to um, address them now. One is, what is, that you might have just answered them, but what is a carrier of an initial algebra? Yeah. And what is the definition of least fixed point? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll take them in reverse order. So, um, I don't know who asked the question, but um, the idea of a fixed point hopefully is clear. So let me just go back. So here is an equation that would define a fixed point of the functor F. Again, you can just think of it, um, this, it's the same way that you would write an equation to define um, a fixed point of a function, right? It's something that when you apply the functor or function to it, gives you back itself. So it's a fixed point and I want the smallest one. And by smallest, I mean that um, if you give me another one, then I can make, I, I have some morphism. Well, they, okay, so the algebras form a category two, and I can make a morphism going from the, um, the initial one to any other one. Okay, that's a little bit, um, it's a little bit advanced and we don't really need it for right now, um, but, um, but that's what it means. And the first, what was the first question again, Daniel? Uh, what's, what's a carrier of an initial algebra? Yeah, so I haven't told you what an algebra is. So that's, I think, where these questions are coming from because they're not really important for what we're doing right this second, okay? And so I have to start somewhere. And <laughs> I have to start, um, I have to start trying to explain somewhere. And some people are gonna have a lot of background and some people are not gonna have very much. So um, I am using some words that I haven't explained yet. But what we're really trying to do is to get, um, is we want to interpret our data types as fixed points of some functor. And it's just that you have to, kind of set up some infrastructure to know that you can do that. And the infrastructure is exactly what's given by this, um, this construction. So for right now, um, that's not super important. Okay. Is it okay to go on or um, does whoever asked the questions want to follow up with something right now? Oh, no, thank you. It's okay, okay. We can, we can proceed. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to be deliberately vague about the requirements on the category in order to know that the um, that these fixed points exist. Uh, sorry to interrupt again, if you don't mind. Is it is it okay to just take take home message so far that we want to interpret a data type as the least fixed point of some functor? Is that is that the message so far? That is exactly the message so far. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So um, yes, thank you for distilling it down. But I want you to know, okay, so why, why not just say that in one sentence rather than three slides or five slides? Because I want you to know that um, it's all, um, because just saying it isn't enough, right? You have, to, you have to kind of prove it and you have to have the mathematics to back that up. And so I'm trying to give you a little bit of, a, um, of an idea where the mathematics is coming from, but I haven't even gotten to the example yet, but hopefully that, that will help. Okay, all right, so for concreteness, um, we'll take C to be said, and we can think of F as being polynomial. Just if you, you know, if you're really trying to be concrete, 
you can say, okay, I don't know category, I'll just think set. When you say um, a functor, I'll think some of products functor. I'll just think like, well, data types, like the way you might write them in Haskell or in Agda. But you can do this more generally. All right, so let's finally see an example. So again, we had these four examples um, before. We looked at Booleans, Nats, Lists, and Trees. And the idea here is that um, I want to look at the data type declaration and I want to um, extract, I want to extract a functor from it because I and that functor's fixed point is going to model this data type. Okay. So if I want to make a Boolean thing, I don't have to provide any data um, to this data type constructor to get a Boolean. So I'm going to use the unit type, I'm going, which I'm going to write as one. I know that Nikhil wrote it differently, but I'm going to write it as one. Um, I actually, I'm not going to write it at all, um, but I'm going to model it by, um, by one. So what is one? One is an object in the category. It's the opposite in a way of the initial object. It's the terminal object. It's the thing so that if I have any other object in the category, there's a unique morphism. Um, um, how do I say this? Uh, going into it, OK? So in other words, um, I'm going to think of that as representing top, like you might think of it as the type top in, um, in Agda, okay, right here. So if I want to make a Boolean, I don't need to provide any data. So I have like one occurrence of top and, or I could use this constructor and I could, um, so I have another occurrence of top and these are my two choices, right? So if I want to make this data type, then the functor that underlies it is the functor, the functor, which on any object X just says, well, don't give me any data or don't give me any data. So I've got a plus here because I've got two constructors. This one corresponds to the constructor false. And I see that I need no, no data to make a, bo a Boolean value from it. And this one here corresponds to true. And I see that to use this constructor, I need no data um, to construct a Boolean value from it. So the, the underlying functor for this data type is f of x is one plus one. And so I'm going to interpret Booleans as the least fixed point of that, which happens to be itself. This is kind of a degenerate case, so it might be hard to see. So let me look at another example. So we have the natural numbers. So again, I've got two constructors, so I'm gonna have one sum. This sum and is gonna to correspond to um, the first constructor. And again, the idea here is that I don't need any data to make a natural number using this constructor. So that's this one. If I wanna use this constructor, then to make a natural number, I have to give you a natural number. And that is corresponding to this X. So the functor says, if I wanna make a, a piece of data, um, what I have to do is provide no pieces, no information, or I have to provide something one thing, one piece of data of the same type. So the functor that underlies this data structure is f of x is one plus x. And we're going to interpret nat as the least fixed point. Still a slightly degenerate case. So maybe a little bit hard to see. Let's look at what happens with lists. Okay, um, all the data types have two, two constructors today. I don't know why, that's just coincidence. So again, two constructors, nil and cons. So I'm gonna have one sum. To make a list of data of type A, I don't need to provide any piece of information. So that corresponds to this one here. To make um, a piece of data using cons, I need to provide, so remember it's list A, I need to provide something of type A, I need to provide a list of A's, and I need, and I should get a list of A's. So the functor here is, f of x is one plus a cross x. And I'm gonna interpret list of a as the least fixed point. And that makes sense. So now finally I have something that's general enough where I can kind of explain um, a little bit better what's happening. So if I take the least fixed point of, of this functor, one plus a cross um, x, then it has, of course it's a fixed point. So it has to satisfy this equation. And don't you agree that list A is either something I made from nil or it's an A cross something that I made something of type list A? So this is the functor that's gonna underlie 
this data type. Is that mu x dot structure like lambda x of lambda calculus? If you don't um, it's, it is in the sense that mu is a binder. Right. Just right. like lambda is. But this is the one that, this isn't like, so if I wrote lambda here, it'd be, this is the function which on every x returns one plus a cross x. But mu x means I want the least fixed point of the function, which on every x returns one plus a cross x. Uh, could, you, could you tell, uh, throw some light on what, when do we use a cross? So we use a plus only when we to okay. account for different constructors, but a cross is used for? Yeah, right, exactly. So what I did here, so if I look at the type of cons, I can, um, uh, I can uncurry it, right? So I could write this type as A cross list A goes to list A. And that cross is this cross. So what I'm saying is to use cons, I need an A thing and a list A thing, an A thing and a list A thing, and then I can make a list A thing from it. Okay, okay. It's exactly like or and and, right? Your plus is yes, like or. One like or and and. So these are, these are polynomial data types. So let's look at tree, let's look at tree because I think, um, again, seeing the analogy, um, you're just seeing more than one example might help. So let's try it. So a tree of A's and B's is either made from leaf or node. And to make something from leaf, I have to give you an A thing. To make tree A, B, I have to give you an A thing. So that's this A. To make a tree of A, B from node, I have to give you a tree A, B and an A and a tree A, B. So I have to give you something of the type I'm trying to make, tree A, B and the B and the tree A, B. So the functor that underlies this data type is this one. And again, if I'm looking at the least fixed point, then on the left side, I'd have tree AB should be, well, this, this where X is tree AB. So that's A plus tree AB cross B cross tree AB. So that's the functor that underlies this data type. Okay. So um, all I've done so far is given you some simple examples, given you some syntax, and I have actually snuck in some semantics of the data types because here's the syntax for this data type, and I've told you the underlying functor, and I've told you how I'm going to interpret the data type. And here I gave you the syntax for the data type, and I told you how I'm going to interpret the data type. And similarly here and here. So we have talked about the syntax and the semantics of ADTs. So again, these code up very simple kinds of constraints um, on data. And what I wanna do now is look at nested types because they code up some fancier um, constraints on data. But is uh, everybody with me so far? Uh, we have one question in the chat that hasn't been answered, I think, is how do, how do the type parameters fit into this? Uh, the functor kind of assumes they're already in scope, but where are they defined? So, um, so that's, that question sounds to me like a mix of syntax and semantics, <laughs> but let me just try to say a few words and then um, whoever asked the question can tell me if I answered it okay. All right, so here there are no parameters and here there are no, no parameters. Here there's one parameter, I don't know if I, yeah, here's a, there's a parameter and here there are two. So the idea with an algebraic data type, remember that the definition, if I look at the types of the constructors, like I'll just pick on list because I think it's the most illustrative. To define um, what list A is, I only involve, have, thing, have um, types in my constructor types that look like list A. So they don't look like list B for any other B. They just look like list A. So what I'm doing here to make the functor is I'm abstracting over list A. So in some sense, the A is fixed, right? And I'm just talking about how to make list A and it only re relies on other values of type list A. I don't know if that was the sense of the question. Uh, yes, Andrew, feel free to chime in if, if you have a follow-up question. Thanks, Daniel. 
And while we're waiting on that, uh, David asked, how much of this holds in a language without the strict positivity requirement? Um, <laughs> uh, none, because you need to have a functor that underlies, um, well, okay, so it depends on what language and what their strict positivity requirement is. But the idea is that you want to have a functor that underlies your data type. So I always want to interpret my algebraic data type as a fixed point of a functor. Because of the theorem that I showed you, this construction of free algebras, um, I don't know how to, no one, not, not just me, but no one knows how to construct a fixed point if we don't have a functor. Okay, so we definitely need a functor. And the strict positivity is um, a syntactic approximation of what it means to have an underlying functor. And so, like I said, that um, the, the strict positivity, like the, the definition of an algebraic data type in, uh, in the AGDA documentation, it, it doesn't capture the most general um, kinds of data types that, can, that could have functors underlying them. Um, that's not important for our purposes here. I'm not trying to construct the most, you know, to tell you like the maximal class of data types that I could define in any given language that um, has functorial semantics. Um, I'm just trying to get the main idea across and to tell you that there is this kind of requirement in AGDA. And um, so if you are looking at the AGDA documentation and you see something that says there's a strict positivity requirement, you'll have some idea what that's about. On the same topic, mm -hmm. then how do, like, yeah, how do they do things in Haskell? Because it has no strict positivity rules. So right. Haskell uh, algebraic data types have no categorical semantics and they're defined only in terms of operational semantics or something. Okay, well, that's actually a really good question. So um, if you were to ask Simon Payton Jones about um, what algebraic data types means, I'm sure he would tell you that it's some collection of um, you know, data in the heap. <laughs> but people who want to build mathematical models of their programming languages or their data types because they, um, they want to understand them in a, in a semantic way, um, you know, will, will say that that is not good enough somehow, or that that provides a, a too machine oriented um, explanation, okay? So, I mean, in Haskell, there are all kinds of issues because the data types are lifted and blah, 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 blah. But I'm not, I just am trying to, I want to tell you a little bit about data types and I have to start somewhere. So I'm starting here and just trying to describe to you the most basic situation. I'm not trying to um, describe to you the internals of Haskell or of Agda or anything like that. Okay, all right. Uh, okay. Sorry, one, one yeah. more question if that's okay. Um, yeah. uh, David, who was asking about where does the A come from? Yes. Uh, asked how is that represented uh, categorically? Um, well, someone, someone mentioned um, it's kind of like Lambda, lambda A mu, um, mu X. Um, well, yeah. And he was asking how that would be represented categorically. Lambda A mu X. Okay, um, I don't understand that part. So here, I'll just talk about, um, I'll talk about list again. So list, this A is not changing, right? That's, so this is Agda codes. So this is why it's on the left-hand side of the, the colon here. So again, every if I'm talking about list A, I only ever see list A here, list A, list A. I don't see list B or list anything else. We're gonna, hopefully, we'll get to um, talk about some data types where we have more, uh, general types for the constructors. That's what I want to talk about next when we get there. But um, this A is kind of fixed in this definition, right? So, um, and where it's represented categorically is right here. So this, so notice this A is like a, a um, text A. This is like a code A. And this A is a mathematical A. And this A is an object in the category that is interpreting this type. So we're thinking of our types as being interpreted by objects in a category. Think of it as sets if you want. Um, there are reasons why that's not exactly precise, but you can think of it like that if you want. And so I think of this slanted A as interpreting this type A. 
again, and this A is interpreting this type A and this B is interpreting that type B. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. I don't know, um, Andrew, if that answered your question, if that is the sense in which you meant, how is it represented categorically? But if it isn't, then maybe you can um, ask another, ask a follow-up um, and Daniel can relay it to me, okay? All right, so remember these ADTs, they code up pretty simple correctness properties. I've got, um, I've got a datum of one of, Two sort, two kinds. Or I don't, I don't mean kind or sort. Um, that's one of two objects. Let me put it that way. Um, here I've got one of countably many objects. Here I've got, um, you know, data that form a list. Here I've got data that form trees. These are pretty, pretty simple constraints. We can capture fancier constraints using what are called nested types. Okay, so the kind of canonical example of a nested type is this type of perfect trees. Okay, so now a perfect tree is gonna be parameterized on, it's gonna have one index, it's gonna be parameterized on one piece of data, but the data we'll see in the types of the constructors can change. So this is very different from what we had on the last slide, right? Again, if I'm talking about list of A, I only ever see list A in the types of the constructors. If I'm talking about tree AB, I only ever see tree ABs. I don't see any other kinds of trees. Okay, that's gonna be different here. So what I've got um, is a data type. That's, well, this, I guess I could, should say a data type constructor, and it's going to have one parameter and P leaf and P node are gonna be its constructors. And these are gonna tell me how to make um, objects in this data type or elements of the data type. So a P leaf will take an A thing, and it will make a P tree of A's. And a P node will take a P tree and make a P tree of A's, but the P tree it takes isn't a P tree of A's. So this is going to take a P tree of A cross A's and give me a P tree of A's. So whereas on the previous slide, I kept kind of trying to emphasize that a list of A only involves lists of A's and a tree of A's and B's only involves trees of A's and B's, here, I'm breaking that. So nested types allow um, more general um, types for the constructors, okay? And because P tree is being used at different types at different instances, like to make a P tree of A, and here I need a P tree of A cross A, um, in Agda, you have to um, put the index on the right side of the colon to indicate that it can change. Okay, so now what kind of constraint is this capturing? It's capturing the constraint that some piece of data you have is, well, I can think of it as saying, I've got a list of elements of type A, but the length is a power of two. And that's because of this kind of twisting of the type. So to make a Petri of type A, here I have to allow, well, here I actually um, allow Petris of, of other types. Okay, so whereas with list, to talk about list of A, I only had to talk about list of A's, to talk about list of B, I only had to talk about list of B's, to talk about list of C's, I only had to talk about list of C's. Here, to talk about P trees of A's, I have to also be able to talk about P tree of A cross A. And of course, to talk about P tree of A cross A, I have to be able to talk about P tree of A cross A, cross A cross A, and so on and so forth. So here, I have to build up the whole data type inductively, right? So the slogan is that for an algebraic data type, um, you, this is a family of, of inductive types. It's a family of types and each, sing, each one of them, it's a family of types, one for each, uh, one for each A and, the whole, the, um, and each one of those families is built inductively. For nested types, I have one family and the whole family has to be built up inductively at once. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Here's another one that's a little bit um, more complicated. So Bush's, Bush, the data type of Bush um, is 
again, has one parameter and it's built up from two constructors. A bush is either empty, so it's a B nil, a, bu a nil bush, or it's a node. And how do I make a node? Well, I have to give a piece of, to make a bush of A's, I have to give a piece of A data and then I have to give a bush of bushes of A's. Okay, so that's even more complicated than this, right? Because here the thing inside is just a, a just a product, but here it's the thing I'm defining. So this is called a truly nested type because um, I'm using the type I'm defining as an index. Okay. So again, here this is a, a fancier constraint, and I don't really know how to describe the constraint except to say that bush A encodes the constraint that a piece of data is a bush of elements of type A. I don't really know how, I don't have a better way to say it. I don't think anyone does. But what you should notice here is that um, syntactically, the constructors can have input types that involve bushes at types other than the one being defined. So for example, if I'm trying to define a P-tree of A's, I have a constructor that involves P trees at A cross A. If I'm trying to define a bush of A's, the, I have a constructor that involves bushes at bush of A. So the constructors can involve input types at instances of the data type I'm defining other than the one I'm defining. But the return types are always the one I'm defining. So this is like, Pick, pick a type argument, like you want P tree of A's or P tree of B's. Okay, pick that. And to make a P tree of A's, you may have to involve P tree at some other type involving A. Or to make a bush of B's, you may have, you can, um, you may have to involve bushes at types other than B, but you're always making a bush of B's. So the return type is always the type you're defining. Right, it's always the return types of the constructors are always the um, instance of the data type that you're defining, but the inputs can be different. Okay, and we already said that for truly nested types like Bush, the instances can even involve themselves, which is a little bit a little bit hard to get your mind around. Okay, and as I just said, the return type of every constructor is still the one that I'm trying to define. So I don't have Bush of A cross A out here. I'm not allowed to have that. We'll, have, we'll see that next time, but we're not allowed to have that for nested types. So here I've just got bush A. Here I can have anything I want, including like weird things like bush of bush. All right, so as I said, a nested type doesn't define a family of inductive types. It defines a whole inductive family where you have to build up the whole family all at once. Again, the um, Agda code has this, um, description of what the general form for a nested type is. It's complicated and um, it doesn't seem to correspond exactly to what is actually implemented. But the key point as before is that there is a strict positivity requirement that's trying to approximate this idea of saying that the data type, um, that there's a functor that underlies the data type. So again, we want to see our nested types as fixed points of functors. So that's, that's what we're going for. Okay, so because of strict positivity, the data types can be um, interpreted as fixed points of functors, but now the functors are higher order. Okay, so what does that mean? So I have to tell you what that means. But um, let me just go back a couple of slides and try to, um, try to set this up a little bit. Okay, so here, if I think about the underlying functor, what I'm really doing, I mean, well, operationally, you can kind of think of what I'm doing as saying, um, okay, the data type I want, it doesn't appear in the arguments to this constructor. It's a return type, but not the arguments. So I don't have to worry about that. I just copy down the, the arguments as before or interpret the arguments as before. Um, and similarly here, um, if I wanna make a list, I have to provide an A thing. And then this X is kind of standing for the whole data type list A, right? It's kind of standing for the whole data type list A. 
So I'm looking for the fixed point of a functor, which on input x gives me one plus a cross x. And if x is list a, the whole data type list a, then I'm saying that a list is one plus a cross list a. And that's exactly what I have here. But for nested types, the thing I'm abstracting over isn't the whole data type, it's actually the data type constructor. Okay. And so when I say, as I did on the next slide, that the functor has to be two slides, that the functor has to be higher order, it's trying to capture that idea that we're not abstracting over a data type now, now we're abstracting over a data type constructor. So I think of a data type constructor is, you know, like list, right? You give me a type, I give you a new type. You give me a type A, I give you a list of A, or you give me a type A, I give you a P-tree of A's. And that sounds like a functor, right? Because a functor takes objects to objects. So I'm going to think of my data type constructors as functors, and I'm going to think of my data types as objects in the category. And if I think of it like that, then I can see that the functors kind of have to be, that I'm interested in taking the fixed points of have to be functors on functors. And that's what I mean by a higher order functor. So let's talk categorically about what that means. All right. Uh, we have a question. Okay. I, most of them are getting answered in the chat by other people. Um, I'm not sure if you want to try to answer this one, but someone asked if you can draw a bush <laughs> or um, provide some insight. Um, I don't have a, a mechanism for drawing. I can't draw on my screen here. So, um, so the short answer is no, but, um, but why don't you try to draw one? I mean, it's, it looks like a crazy broom. If you try and draw it, I think you'll pretty quickly see that it, it looks like a kind of a, a crazy broom where things are, you've got things hanging off of things, hanging off of things, hanging off of things with arbitrary branching. So I, again, sorry, don't have a mechanism for drawing on the screen here. Oh, so looks like maybe someone's gonna draw one and hold it up. I'm not sure, is that what's going on, is it Brandon? No, okay. Okay, sorry, just, just volunteered you. <laughs> okay, um, but you can ask me afterward and I can talk to you about it then, whoever asked that question. Okay. So um, again, just like ADTs, nested types can be seen as fixed points of functors, but now the functors have to be higher order. So I wanna tell you what that means. So if I have two categories, C and D, then the functors from the first one to the second one also form a category, right? So the objects of that category are the functors from C to D and the morphisms are natural transformations between the functors. All right, well, if you don't know what a natural transformation is, you're in luck because I'm just about to tell you. So a natural transformation from one functor to another, so these functors here are both going from C to D. It's just a collection of morphisms where one for every object in the domain category and the um, morphism at that object goes from the thing I get by applying the first functor to that object, goes from that to the thing that I get by applying the second functor to that object. And that would be great, except that of course there has to be a property that it satisfies. And here's the property. So I just drew it as a diagram. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, I have a functor f, or I have a, a, a functor f going from c to d, and I have a functor g going from c to d. And if I want to know about the component of the natural transformation at x, it goes from fx to gx. And of course, that's for any object x in the, um, in the domain category. So if you give me another object like y, of course, its component goes from fy to gy. But these two components aren't independent. They have to um, be connected in this way. And what way is that? Well, remember that a functor not only has an object, an action on objects, but it has an action on morphisms, which we write as map. Well, um, if I had a function that went from X to Y in the first category, 
if I um, looked at the action of the functor F on that morphism, it would go from Fx to F Fy. And in G, the action, the action of G on F would go from Gx to Gy. And I have to have this square commute. So if I go around this way, it has, I have to get the same thing I would get if I went around that way. Okay. So if you're thinking intuitively, if you're a programmer and you're kind of thinking, oh, this category theory stuff is really weird, um, think of this as a polymorphic function. This isn't exactly right right now, but it will be more, more right as we go on. Think of this as a polymorphic function. And think of X as the, uh, the, um, the argument that it's polymorphic in, right? So um, what I have is kind of like a function for every object that or every argument. And I don't just have this collection of functions, but they're connected up in this way. Okay, so so again, we're trying to talk about this cat this category of functors from C to D. So the objects are functors, the morphisms are natural transformations, and remember, if you have a category, um, you have to respect identities and um, and composition. So the identity on F is just the identity natural transformation. What is that? That's a natural transformation where every component is just an identity fun function, identity morphism. And how do I, if I have two natural transformations, eta and mu, how do I compose them? Well, I should get a new natural transformation, eta compose mu, and that means I should tell you what its component is at some x, and I'm just going to take the com the um, the components. Uh, piecewise and compose them. Okay, so again, this is just a, this is a well-known, well-studied category. Um, if you have its functor categories are real categories, um, just like all the other ones. And um, they're, they're well-known and they're well-studied. And this is where you would actually, um, you would look at functor categories if you were interested in seeing how that uh, construction of free algebras go. Okay, so we're going to interpret our nested types as fixed points of functors, but now the functors are gonna be these higher order functors, not just the first order functors we had before. So uh, just to kind of, um, I don't know, make it more plausible, um, a higher order functor is a functor on a functor category. So it has an action on objects and it has an action on morphisms. So if I had a functor, then the higher order functor acting on that functor should give me a new functor. And the new functor has to have, just looking at these first two bullet points, has to have an action on um, objects and an action on morphisms. But then HF um, should also have an action on morphisms. So I've got an action on objects, which is these first two bullet points, and I've got an action on morphisms, which is this last one. And all I did here was kind of write the, the types of the various pieces. And of course, um, the action on morphisms, we'll just call map H. It has to preserve identities and compositions, just like in any category, but now the identities are the identities for the um, natural transformations and the composition is a, um, the composition for natural transformations, the ones that we saw right at the end of the previous slide. Okay, so the upshot is to give an initial algebra semantics for nested types, we have to compute fixed points of these higher order functors. I'm sorry, before we moving on, may I clarify? Uh, this high order fun functor H mm -hmm. uh, always have to uh, give a functor from the same category to the same category from C to D, or can it give a functor from <laughs> arbitrary category to any arbitrary? <laughs> right. So, um, okay. So the idea is if I have, if I, 
have a couple categories, C and D, and I look at all the functors from C to D, that will form a category. Okay, right. so this, yeah, so this does that make sense? So the C and D are fixed, but they're not special here. They're just kind of fixed, but arbitrary here. Okay, so we wanna give an initial algebra semantics for our nested types. And to do this, we have to compute fixed points of higher order functors. And that sounds really hard, but here's the thing. Under the same conditions that I was deliberately vague about before for constructing these fixed points, um, when you pass to the functor category, they all still hold. So we, under the same exact conditions, we can compute fixed points of higher order functors. So that's really nice because um, it just says like, you don't need any addition. If you wanna compute some fixed points of first order functors, then to compute fixed points of higher order functors on the same categories, you don't need any additional um, restrictions or anything. So that, that is a really nice thing. All right, well, let's talk about how this works in terms of um, a concrete example. So um, here's my data type of perfect trees again, P trees. So remember the thing I'm trying to abstract over is the type constructor. So the higher order functor says, give me something, a functor and an argument for it. And what I should do is, well, I can make a new, a new P tree of A's by, oh, I used X here. Ooh. Okay, read every time I have X read A <laughs> to correspond to this. So, um, I either provide something of the date of the appropriate type. So here's the argument to P leaf, or that's this or to use P node, I provide something of this type. Okay. And then I'm going to interpret um, P tree as the least fixed point of this higher order functor. So it's going to be the least F such that h of f of x equals f of x. And that's what, this, that's what this does. So it's just exactly the same thing that we did at the level of types, but now we're doing it at the level of functors. Here's another example. For bushes, I can make bush A by providing no data, that's my one, or by providing A and well, the thing I'm abstracting over is bush. So a bush of bush of A's. So the underlying higher order functor here is the one that um, will take an F and an X and give you back one plus X cross F of F of X. And so I'm gonna interpret bush as the least fixed point of this higher order functor. So again, just replaying everything, but one level up. Okay, so one thing I want to point out is that algebraic data types, are they also uniform in their type parameters? So even though we first talked about, a, about ADTs as fixed points of first order functors, we can see them as fixed points of higher order functors as well. And there is a benefit to doing this. So how does that go? Here's list, our canonical ADT. I can see it as, a nested type where I just didn't vary the parameter, right? So the higher order functor that underlies this is, well, I can build a list by giving no data and using nil, or to use cons, I'd have to provide a piece of data and the thing I'm trying to construct with that type and then that would give me the thing I'm trying to construct at that type. So I can interpret lists as fixed points of this higher order functor. Why would I want to do that? Well, if you haven't ever seen this before, you might think it's to make your brain explode, but that is not true. So here's a reason. If I have an ADT or a nested type, and this is a fixed point equation that describes it. And if H is the kind of agda code for the underlying functor H, 
like what we just saw on the previous slide, then as I said, I'm gonna interpret D as a least fixed point of, of H. But now H is a fixed point in a category of functors. So it's fixed point is a functor. And that is the key thing. The fixed point is a functor. So the fixed point has a map, right? Because it's a functor. Every functor has this map. It has this action on, um, on morphisms. So that means if I look at my data type, it has a map function. So I know that we're all really used to saying, oh, here's a data type list and it has this map function. But where does that map function come from? We could just write it down, but it maybe is also helpful to know where it comes from semantically. And I've just what I've just done by showing you that an, an ADT can be also seen as a fixed point of a higher order functor is tell you where its map function comes from. So the map for lists is just exactly what you think of as the map for lists. But what it, what it really is, or the way I would think of it is, it's the reflection back into syntax. So here it's Agda syntax of the action on morphisms of this least fixed point of this higher order functor that's interpreting my data type. Similarly, map of tree looks exactly like what you would write down if I just asked you to write down a map for trees. But again, that's where it's coming from. And what about Bush? Bush also has a map. It's a fixed point of a higher order functor. So, well, the fixed point of a higher order functor is a functor. So it has, an, it has a map, it has an action on morphisms. And I'm just gonna reflect that back into syntax and the map for Bush is gonna look like what you would probably write down if I gave you five minutes and a type checker. <laughs> okay, all right, so check out, check this out. Here's the thing about these map functions. They all kind of um, preserve the shape of a piece of data, but they might change the actual data, right? Like that's what map for list does. If I, if I had an empty list, I get an empty list. If I had a, a cons, I get a cons, but now I, maybe I've changed the data. For trees, if I, um, if I used to have a leaf, I still have a leaf. If I used to have a node, I still have a node, but maybe I've changed the data. Same thing for bushes. If I had a, an empty bush, I still have an empty bush. And if I used to have a node, I still have a node, but maybe I've changed the data. So a map preserves the shape of a structure, but potentially changes its contents, just as always. But again, what I'm showing you is sort of where how this comes up um, categorically, how it comes up from the categorical semantics. So it's not, um, it's not like you just write down some random stuff and it happens to work. It's like there's a principled mathematical reason that it works. Okay, um, let's see. I wanna just um, look ahead and I think I'm almost to the end. I think I've got two more slides, which is good because I've only got about 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, so, um, well, these categorical interpretations of fixed points um, give map functions for our algebraic data types and our nested types. But these, um, this semantics also gives us some naturality results. So remember um, that we have these kind of commuting squares for, um, for natural transformation. So suppose I had one between one data type represented by as a fixed point of a higher order functor H and another one. So maybe I have, um, as we'll have on the next slide, maybe I have a um, natural transformation going from, um, from P trees to lists or something then this is the diagram that I have to, um, this is the naturality diagram. It's just the instance of the diagram I drew before, but instead of having F and G, now I have mu H, which is a functor, and mu H prime, which is a functor. So those both have maps. And so this is the same naturality diagram I had before. So I have this, um, this commuting square. So if I, again, reflect this back into syntax, and if I think of my natural transformations as polymorphic functions between the data types whose interpretations are these fixed points of H and H prime respectively, then what this says is that 
Well, remember that um, map is going to change the data but preserve the shape. Well, natural transformations, um, you can kind of see it from here. I probably should have said it earlier. They keep the data the same, but they change the shape, right? Whereas map changes, uh, keeps the shape the same, but changes the data, right? Does that make sense? So going across, the data type is changing. Going down, the data is changing. So what this diagram says, if again, if I kind of reflect back into syntax, is it doesn't make any difference if I change the shape and then change the data or first change the data and then change the shape. I should get exactly the same thing, okay? So a concrete example of that I can give on the next slide. Um, so as I said, the naturality square says, doesn't matter, you can change the shape and then the data or change the data and then the shape. So suppose you had a polymorphic flattened function. So it would say, you give me a type A and a P tree of A's and I'll give you a list of A's, right? So I'm just gonna think of it as doing this. So a P tree of A's could be, um, so remember perfect trees kind of correspond to lists whose lengths are powers of two. So this would be a good perfect tree. And what flatten is gonna do is just make a list out of it, right? So this says, well, a perfect tree of A has a map function. So if I take, it should take P, tree of, P trees of A to P tree of B if I'm given a function from A to B. And um, flatten will take a P tree of A to a list of A. So this says, if I were to flatten and then map, that's the same as if I were to map and then flatten. And intuitively, I, I hope that, that that should make sense. So if I started off with this per smaller perfect tree, if I flatten it, I'd get this. And if I mapped, I'd get this. This is the map for lists. But if I use the map for P trees, I would first map and get this and then flatten and get it catch up to myself. Okay. And again, um, this just comes from the fact that we have a functorial semantics. So we have this map, we have, um, we have these natural transformations, which kind of correspond to, poly um, to polymorphic functions. And the naturality diagram just says, it doesn't matter which order I do these um, operations in. Okay, so that's, that's pretty cool. So all of this stuff comes from the fact that I'm giving a functorial semantics for my data types. Okay. Um, there's actually way more stuff that you can get from the fact that you have the functorial semantics. Um, I think Nikhil was talking about folds in his lecture. Um, so we can get folds. They also have a nice categorical interpretation that has to do with algebras, which I didn't talk about. Um, but from the semantics, we get all this kind of programming kit. We get all these programming things programming constructs. And what I've done today is shown you how you get these for ADTs and for nested types. Next time we're gonna look at GADTs, these generalized algebraic data types. I'm gonna tell you how you further can change the constraints on the constructors of your data type to get GADTs. And what we're gonna see is that for GADTs, things start getting a bit trickier, but I would also say a little bit more enlightening. Okay, so the next lecture is going to have um, much more high powered category theory in it. I will try to give as intuitive um, an explanation for each piece of it as I can. Um, but GADTs are a lot, they're a lot fancier, they're a lot kind of harder to understand. So maybe not surprisingly, the underlying mathematics is going to be a lot more sophisticated. Right, but um, that's it for this. And this um, is a little bit about what we'll do next time. And I hope I'll see you there and I'll hang out here in case there are some questions just for a couple minutes and then um, we can take them on Slack or something. Okay, thanks everyone. Questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So uh, in, the, in the very start, you, you use the category type. Could you probably give some, an example of a non-identity morphism on this category? Um, a category type. I don't think I did use a category type, but um, again, think of um, think of the category of sets. So the objects are sets, and a function from sets to sets. Any old function from sets to sets would be a morphism in that category. So if I had the set um, containing two elements one and two, and the set containing three elements one, two, and three, 
I could just think of any function that mapped the first set to the second set. That would be a morphism in that category. Okay, thank you. Is that helpful? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Patricia. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you talked a little bit about this duality between changing the data and keeping the, the shape the same and changing the shape and keeping the type the same. I'm curious if, um, if, if this works with recursive types, I mean, if, if you're, if the type that you're defining is, 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 is self type, does that um, um, uh, break this or uh, is there any way um, that this, this would not hold, uh, say, if the parameter refers to itself somehow? Well, I think we, we actually saw that um, for bushes, right? So here I have this constructor B node and the parameter is exactly itself. And um, I can get, we can give um, an underlying higher order now functor for bushes and we can see bushes as a fixed point of that. So I would have exactly um, this kind of a diagram for if, if this were bushes or if this were bushes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have one minute because I don't know what's next, but I want to keep keep to the time. So if anyone has a quick one. So I have a question. Uh, can we generalize to uh, mutually inductive types? Yes, for mutually inductive types, it's um, it also works again, like a mutually inductive ADT or a mutually inductive nested type. Yes. Okay. That was a quick one. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, right. Patricia. Yeah, so um, next time, again, GADTs, but again, the category theory is gonna get way crazier. So just, uh, I, hope I hope that doesn't scare you, but I just want you to know. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah, maybe some of you can organize some tutorial this afternoon for uh, students that are not so uh, strong in category theory. Yeah, sometimes we, when we have OPSS, uh, you have a course campus, right? We organize uh, things like that. But now, so it's up to you if, if somebody is uh, knows. Uh, maybe Patricia, could you maybe post some uh, some uh, notions that will be good for them to know uh, for yeah. the lecture tomorrow. Um, so then if we have some students can do some uh, uh, tutorial on it to get prepared, that will help. Yeah, so um, in the, on the um, OPLSS page, um, Jim, I think already did post some, um, some resources for the kinds of things ah. I talked about today for categories, functors, natural transformations. Um, the only, the other idea that I'm gonna talk about, um, okay, and higher order functors, I didn't provide anything for. So higher order functors, and left cam extensions. Those are the things I'm gonna talk about next time. Okay. So it's only two. Sorry, higher order functor, functors and left-hand extensions, is that what you said? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the type, in the, in the uh, chat. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I will, so, yeah. I will, yeah, I will try to, um, to give intuition, I mean, um, I, my experience is that like with category theory, you can read the definition, but it takes a while to, um, to get some good intuition from the definitions. So I will tell you the definitions, but I will try to give you some intuition, but making those match up is something you can't really, I, I, I don't know how to do that in real time. <laughs> Maybe someone smarter than me knows, in which case I wish they would share their secret. 